Welcome back. This is AP Environmental Science. We're going to continue here in Chapter 3. We're going to talk about mat uh, how matter cycles through the biosphere and through uh, ecosystems. Quickly, I want to remind you that when we refer to matter cycling through the ecosystem, that Earth is a closed system in terms of matter. So uh, matter does not increase or decrease uh, on Earth, it remains the same. So we don't get any input of matter from space, uh, nothing substantial enough to uh, really include it in this picture uh, and consistent enough to include it. Because obviously, yeah, we get um, some meteorites and stuff which would be considered matter, but it's just not enough uh, to consider it an open system. But energy, on the other hand, that cycle is an open system because it's a constant input of energy from outside the Earth, from the Sun, and then it cycles through uh, the Earth and then also is kicked back out into uh, space. And so matter, today we're going to talk about matter cycling through the ecosystem. I'm going to talk about the water cycle, I'll talk about the carbon cycle, and then I'll do another video on the nitrogen and phosphorus cycle because there's a lot of details packed in those. Uh, so uh, matter cycles uh, through living things and also through non-living things. So one way matter cycles is through the food chain. An organism eats another organism. That means that that matter is now incorporated into that organism that has eaten that organism. And... Uh, and then when that organism dies, it goes back into the ground. So living things cycle matter through a system, but also non-living things. And that's what we'll, uh, we'll talk about a little bit more today. So just real quick, biosphere. Biosphere is a combination of all ecosystems on Earth. This is going to include all life forms, and it's going to also include non-living components. So that's what the biosphere is. Uh, bio means life, sphere is the geometric shape that we're standing on right now, and so that's the biosphere. Bio, biogeochemical cycles is an important term to understand. This is what we're going to be talking about today. And uh, in the word is the definition, but this is the movement of matter within and between ecosystems. And it's going, this movement is taking place because of biological geologic and chemical processes. So biogeochemical cycles uh, is movement of matter because of biological, geologic, and chemical processes. So the first one, the hydrologic cycle or the water cycle is just the movement of water molecules uh, through the biosphere or through an ecosystem. And so this is an important diagram. It's in your book. And uh, you probably know a lot about this, uh, the water cycle and how it takes place, uh, but this is just a refresher for you. So uh, the sun inputs energy into the biosphere. That uh, solar energy is going to heat up the earth, and so solar energy goes down, moves down, hits the land, heats up the earth, also heats up the water in the ocean. This is going to excite and increase the energy of the water molecules. So now the water molecules have more energy. They're going to be moving faster, so more kinetic energy. And eventually they're going to break free from whatever they're, they're on. They're going to change state. So that solar energy is going to cause evaporation. And so evaporation on the, from the soil. And then the majority of it is from the ocean. And the oceans are very important. The ocean is the majority of uh, the surface of the earth. And so the oceans really drive climates and, uh, and much of the evaporation is occurring uh, from the oceans. Uh, as well, plants are going to go through transpiration. That's just the release of water from the plant through the leaves. And another term that we use for that is evapotranspiration. And so off of forest, uh, any vegetative uh, cover, you're going to have evaporation or transpiration up into the upper atmospheres. As it moves up, the upper atmosphere is much cooler, and so it's going to condense any of that gaseous uh, water, and uh, it's going to form clouds. So now the, the water has less energy, it's cooler. 
And eventually it's going to rain down in the form of uh, rain, snow, or hail, and we call this precipitation. And it's going to rain down to the earth and hit the ground. It's going to be absorbed by plants through their roots. Uh, if there's cover on the land, when the rain hits the ground, that vegetation is going to slow it down. That's a very important thing. Uh, it slows it down so that the plants can actually absorb that water. It slows it down so it can also percolate through the soil layers and be added to our groundwater and aquifers. And so the groundwater will eventually move towards the oceans. But uh, vegetative cover is very important to slow water down so that that type of thing can take place. But even still, there's going to be some surface runoff. Water is going to run off into lakes, rivers, streams, and then eventually into the ocean. And uh, so that's sort of the water cycle. It's going to restart that uh, whole process again. Humans in the system now have changed this water cycle slightly. And so because of agricultural lands clearing for agriculture or uh, putting roads and such, now there's going to be an increase of runoff, so when that water hits the ground, it's going to quickly, it's going to have more speed, and it's going to quickly run off or move along the surface of the earth and not be able to percolate into the ground and increase our groundwater supply and that sort of thing. So humans have an impact on the water cycle by putting, um, you know, roads and concrete all around and also clearing forested areas. So the hydrologic cycle or the water cycle, terms you need to know, transpiration, evapotranspiration, and then runoff. So please take a look at those and memorize those. And the carbon cycle. The carbon cycle is something you should be familiar with. The carbon cycle is very important, and the majority of it, again, is going to be driven by the oceans. The oceans are so unbelievably large, uh, covering most of the surface of the Earth. And so most atmospheric CO2 is going to be dissolved into the oceans. Photosynthetic uh, creatures, phytoplankton and such, are going to uh, uh, take up or absorb this CO2 and build tissues. So the producers absorb that CO2. And then consumers eat and uh, those producers and ultimately respire CO2 back into the oceans and ultimately back into the atmosphere. Those consumers now have part of that carbon included in their bodies and when they die decomposers in the ocean are going to uh, eat those organisms as they move towards the, the ocean floor and those decomposers are ultimately going to respire more CO2 uh, that they've gotten from the consumers. Some, however, is going to, so uh, CO2 uh, will dissolve into the ocean, grab a calcium, and it will precipitate out of solution, and you're going to have it sort of float to the bottom slowly. This happens real slowly over time, and you'll get uh, limestone sedimentation at the bottom of the ocean. This takes a long time to occur, but that's called sedimentation, and this is because carbon dioxide grabs hold of uh, calcium, making calcium carbonate. Over here on the land, the same thing happens. Uh, CO2 from the atmosphere is going to be absorbed by producers. Consumers are going to eat the producers and then respire CO2 back into the atmosphere. Decomposers are going to eat any dead consumers right? That sort of thing. If the consumers don't die, I'm sorry, if they don't get decomposed fast enough, they get buried. And if they get buried, there's a lot of pressure. And over the course of millions of years, they become uh, fossils and ultimately become fossil fuels. And that's these little deposits you see here. So over the course of millions of years, fossil fuels develop. That's oil, natural gas, coal. Uh, and this is a hydrocarbon. We learned about this, and in the Industrial Revolution, we started to extract these hydrocarbons from the ground, and this is a new thing. So for billions of years, uh, the carbon cycle had been cycling naturally, but now humans are sort of putting this out of balance. We extract CO, or we extract fossil fuels, 
We use them in our cars or in industry, and this contributes to the amount of CO2 concentrations in our atmosphere. This is a new contribution, and it's causing our uh, carbon cycle to be out of balance. And there's some implications such as acidification of the oceans. Uh, we'll talk more about that later. And also the warming of our climate on Earth. Um, is due to us using these fossil fuels and putting more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. As well, humans have uh, taken forest areas and need building supplies and fuels, so they cut down forest, which typically will absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. When you take that uh, forest away, now you've reduced the amount of CO2 that can be absorbed. And sometimes if you burn, if you burn it, that CO2 is put back into the atmosphere. We're going to talk more about this because there's some interesting things taking place in the Arctic. As the Arctic warms, uh, some uh, release of uh, methane and carbon dioxide from some do dead organisms is happening. We'll talk more about this in another chapter. Next uh, video, I'll talk about the uh, nitrogen cycle and phosphorus cycle.